good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. And whether you're joining us in person or through the live stream, I just want to say that you're welcome here. And it is so nice to be seeing more and more people coming in to worship in person, right? But if you're not able to, uh, we also want you to know that, uh, that we recognize that you're here with us, joining with us in spirit. Uh, make sure that you drop a comment or check in so that we know that you're with us online. Uh, this morning and worshiping with us. My name is David Mosgrip, and I lead um, the Contemporary Worship Service here. And uh, 945, in case you weren't sure which service you were at, I know some mornings it's like, man, I made it. What time is it? So um, you are, you're here. Good job, everybody. All right, so uh, this morning we're going to sing a song uh, beginning just lifting God up for who he is and that he is our uh, God who overcomes, but he is also with us. So uh, let's stand and I'll pray as we open up this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you so much that that's who you are, that you are the God who is great, who is above everything, but that you love us, that you call us your children. And so we can be excited about everything that we go through in life, knowing that you are right beside us. In your name, amen. coming on the clouds it's coming on the clouds kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will pray his broken hearts declare his praise but who can stop the lord almighty because our god is the lion the lion of judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow for him so open up the gates make way before the king of kings our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Oh, 
All right, well, isn't that such a good way to start the morning is just declaring that God is the king above everything else that we see happening, right? Well, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, why don't you be seated as we continue? Good morning. Um, I am Jane Ryder, one of the co-lead um, pastors here, along with my husband, Gary. Um, I just wanted to say my welcome to you this morning, whether you are with us here in the building or at home. We're so pleased to be worshiping with you today. We've got a couple announcements that are all really very, very important. One of them is we are having a car wash today. So whether you're here or at home, the car wash runs by our youth from 9 until 1 o'clock today. And they are taking, um, it's, it's $7, plus, of course, you can always give a tip or a donation. And you can pre-register, so if you're at home or even here, you can pre-register, or just show up, and they are taking cash and credit. And all the funds raised today in this car wash is going to help them throughout the summer and all the stuff that they're going to do. So this is a great way to support our youth. So today, from 9 until 1. So as soon as we're done with the service, I'll remind you as you're leaving, if you're here or if you're at home, drive on over and let the kids get your car clean for you. Next week, we're going to be having the blood mobile will be here. Same thing, like 9 to 1. When you're done with the service, you can go out. And this is a way. So he, today you'll get to bless our students in their, what they're trying to do in ministry this summer. Next week, you can bless the community and bless by giving of your blood. And that will really help people you will never meet, but because we all understand that we do those things together. So whether you're with us here or online, come over to the church and give next week for the um, blood drive as well. We also have one more thing, and this is something I guess I'm going to push a little harder. Next Saturday, we are doing a serve day on campus. And this is basically we're going to work outside. We're going to spiff up the campus. We're going to change out some of the old mulch, put some new mulch in, do a little weeding. This is an opportunity for families to serve together. I mean, this is, it's really hard, actually, to find a way to teach your kids how to serve. So this is one of those neat, neat opportunities where you can come and bring your kids, and they can kind of mess around and sort of help you, and they can see you working. We'll make sure if you come with other families that you guys stay together, and you guys can work on one section together. Um, it's going to go from 9 to 1, and we're going to feed you lunch, and we're going to do it all very safely, and we're going to do it with our COVID guidelines, and we're going to be outside, and you're going to get to know people. And it'll be a great opportunity. If you're not sure you have tons of energy, you come and you pace yourself and you do what you can. So I just want to encourage you, but specifically in this service, I want to say to those of you with families, if you're looking for a way to teach your kids what it means to serve, as you do it by bringing them with you and they see you serve. And that's the most powerful thing you can do. So what you do is you just sign up online for next week so we'll make sure that we have enough food for everybody. I hope that you will seriously consider doing that. That would be really wonderful. Okay, now we're going to enjoy a children's moment by Jennifer Blessing. Hey guys, Miss Jen here. I'm sitting in my office after a long day of teaching. I'm a teacher, but I teach college students. One of the best parts about being a teacher is that I get to talk to my students. I get to know them when they ask me questions, when they share things that are going on in their life, that the more you talk to someone, the more you get to know them. And that's a really important thing for a teacher to know, to get to know their students and how they're doing. It's also really important to talk to someone who's even more important than a teacher, God. And when we talk to God, we tend to call that prayer. We talk about the things that we might pray to God about, the things that are hard about our day, or the things that were great about our day. In fact, just like a teacher wants to hear how students are doing, God wants to hear how we're doing. He wants to hear the ups and the downs. He wants to hear your excitement and even your sadness. God wants to get to know us. Sometimes it's hard to pray the sign I have in my office there. Pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. But there's lots of ways that we can pray to God. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells his disciples a way to pray, to say what might sound like fancy words. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We don't always have to talk to God using big fancy words. Sometimes we can just use plain words. 
For I once heard a story about a little kid who was saying bedtime prayers. Mom and dad were in the hallway and heard the kid not praying, but singing the alphabet. A, B, C, D. They let the kid finish the alphabet and came in and said, what were you doing? And the little kid said, I have so much to tell God, but I know he knows what's going on with me. I just don't have the big fancy words. So I thought if I gave him all the letters, he could sort it out. God can sort it out. He wants to hear from us with big fancy words or even just plain words because he wants to get to know us and he wants us to get to know him. So this week, I want you to think about maybe starting the practice of talking to God whenever you have a free moment or maybe before dinner or before bedtime. Tell him something good that happened or maybe even something sad that happened because he wants to get to know you. Let's try to take a moment to pray here. Dear God, thank you for wanting to get to know us. Thank you for giving us fancy words and not so fancy words so we can share with you all the things that are going on in our life. We love you. Amen. Have a great week. Yeah, and I think that's a good reminder for us as adults as well, right? We tend to think, oh, I, c I can talk to my my kids or my wife or my friends one way, but it's like all of a sudden we, we think about prayer and it's like, oh, I got to get all my words together. I got, you know, to the, to the being that like knows what we're thinking, we think, oh, I have to get my words together so that he hears it, he hears it a certain way. But just knowing that we can come before God as we are um, is just an awesome, awesome thing. We don't have to have like this big ritual. We can just be sitting, like she said, in, in her office, you know, and we can be talking to God. Um, and that's, um, how this next song starts is, you know, just coming before God and expressing the things that we uh, feel about about who he is. So why don't you stand and join us as we continue in worship this morning. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin you are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wandering you are joy you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. No, I run into your arms, I run into your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever rain. sing you are more you are more you are more than my words will ever say you are I'm running. No, I run into your arms. I run into your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world. sing no other name Jesus 
Jesus, Jesus, and my heart will sing in no other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing in no other name. Jesus, Jesus. of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever rain I run to your arms I run to your arms the riches of your love will always Nothing compares to your embrace. Light up the world forever. Rain. And my heart will sing in no other name. Jesus, Jesus. Father, I pray that that would be something that's true for our lives, that uh, we would be focused on you first and foremost and above everything else. And we know we have all kinds of different things going on in our lives, but that our heart would be that we love you and that we thank you for what you've done for us. And so everything else starts to revolve around you instead of around our desires. In your name, amen. things have passed away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the cornerstone the things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again and you cause your sun to shine on darkest nights for all that you've done we will pour out our love and this will be our anthem song Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. The hopeless have found their hope. The hopeless have found their hope. The orphan now has a hope. All that was lost has found its place in you. You lift our weary heads. You make us strong instead. You took these rags and you made us beautiful. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. And this will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Jesus. 
Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Our hearts adore. Our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. It's Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we Father, we do thank you that we can come before you, that we can praise you, that we can talk to you, that we can pray to you, Father. And I pray that that would be um, the cry of our heart, that you are the one that our hearts adore, not all of the other distractions that we have in life, but that we would be focused on you. And I pray that this morning uh, we would have our hearts and our minds focused on the message that you have for us. In your name, amen. You may be seated. All right, it turns out that Americans like to pray. Um, back in 2017, the, the Barna Group, which does research um, among faith-based um, organizations to find out like, what the cultural trends are, did a study, and they found out that 79% of Americans pray. That means that prayer is the most common spiritual practice among those of us in the U.S. And that really has nothing to do with whether you have an affiliation to a denomination or if you never go to church at all. It doesn't matter. It turns out we still pray. So over the next two weeks, Gary and I thought we would share some sermons on prayer and just different perspectives on it. Because prayer is something you tend to do most of your life, but at times can be kind of frustrating. So I've picked a, a short little story that I want to share with you. And it comes out of the book of Luke, and it, it first begins because the disciples simply say to Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus starts out with some instructions, and, and Jennifer Blessing alluded to it in the children's moments, part of the Lord's Prayer, he kind of begins at teaching them. And then he shares this story, which kind of even takes it deeper, this story about the complexities of prayer. And so I'm going to read this to you, and, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about it because it's a strange little story. So let's begin. I'm reading, as I said, out of Luke 11, starting with verse 5. He also, meaning Jesus, he also said to them, Imagine that one of you has a friend, and you go to that friend in the middle of the night saying, Friend, loan me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has arrived, and I have nothing to set in front before him. Imagine further that he answers from within the house, Don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I assure you, even if he wouldn't get up and help because of his friendship, he will get up and give his friend whatever he needs because of his friend's brashness. And I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Everyone who asks receives. Whoever seeks finds. To everyone who knocks, the door is opened. 
Which father among you would give a snake to your child if a child asked for a fish? If a child asked for an egg, what father would give the child a scorpion? If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, this is a strange little story, but it's basically about asking, seeking, and knocking, which technically just means ask. Keep asking. Be persistent. Don't back down. And doesn't that seem a little strange to you? I mean, if you think about it, why do we have to be persistent in asking God, especially if this God loves us so much, loves us, loves us, you know, would never give us a, you know, like a parent would never give a, a snake to a child that asked for a fish. Well, if God loves us so much, why do we have to keep badgering him? When I think of the times when I have to bug something for somebody, you know, if, if I ask for something, it's usually one, they don't have what I want, two, they don't have the time to give it to me, or three, maybe they don't think I deserve it. I mean, I don't know. Those are the things that go through my mind. And what do I do? I just get more persistent and I keep asking and letting them know I'm not backing down until you give me what I want, right? So when you hear this story, I think about that and I think, does that mean God doesn't want me to have what I've asked for? Does God not care? Does God not have time for me? All kinds of things go through my mind. And so that's a great story to kind of dive in a little deeper and see what it means. And let's begin with the ancient culture in which it was told. Because that's really important. Understanding the context. So for an early Jewish community that heard this story, they would have all chuckled at this. And let me explain why. In the first century, hospitality was a priority. Like everybody took it really seriously. You did not ignore hospitality. In fact, if someone came to visit you, it was the responsibility of the entire town to help feed that person. Everybody chipped in. So there's no ignoring a guest that comes even in the middle of the night or late at night because everybody's responsible for hospitality. It was part of the, the thing that defined that early, um, the, the early Jews. It defined them. They were hospitable people. Now, when you, the guy's like, hey, I can't help you. My family's gone to bed for the night. Most dwellings would have been one room homes. And so he wasn't kidding because they all slept in the middle of it. And when he said they'd all gone to bed, they had all probably gone to bed. And with one person getting up would have woke up the whole group. But this is actually rather humorous because the houses were all so close together, the whole community was hearing the dialogue between the two friends. Everybody knew what was going on. And everybody was probably laying in their beds chuckling and saying, well, even if he doesn't want to get up for his friend because he's in a cranky mood, he's certainly going to get up for the hospitality because we are hospitable. So that early congregation would have kind of laughed at this, like that's kind of funny. Of course he's going to get up. He's just cranky. We all know he's cranky. But then the story goes even a little deeper. And Jesus starts saying, what about a parent? What about a father or a mother? If a child asks for something like fish, something to eat, are they going to give him a snake? I mean, if, if that child asks for something of their parent, isn't a human parent going to lovingly give them what they need? That's what parents do, right? We, we cross oceans to give our kids the stuff they want. And so really what's happening here is that Jesus is establishing very first and foremost is the love of God for his people. It's greater than any other human relationship, which is hard to believe when you think about how much you love your family. But it turns out that God loves us even more than a human relationship, whether it's a close friend or a, a parent even. That's how much we're loved by God. And so that's sort of the premise of the story. But then Jesus asks this whole thing about ask and seek and knock. So then you're saying, well, what does that have to do with it? Why, why are you pushing that? Why are you encouraging us to be persistent? The first thing that comes to my mind is that because Jesus knows that was going to be a question of those early Christians. Because it turns out he knew they were going to have to wait for the answers for their prayers. Now, I'm sorry, if you've lived at all, you know sometimes we have to wait. And sometimes we have to really wait. Prayer can be a really frustrating thing. There are times when we're crying out to God and begging him, and it's like 
the heavens are silent. And he just won't give us the very thing we need. I'm not even talking wants. I'm talking needs or the needs of our family members who we love. We're crying out to God and he just doesn't seem like he's paying any attention. And I think that's why Jesus told the story so we would understand that there's more to prayer than an immediate answer. There's so much more. So now let's kind of look at this. So, so first of all, the story's told because the reality is we're going to have to wait. Have you had to wait on prayers? My longest prayer that I, and, and it's funny because I have family members who really beat this number for other stuff. But for me, my longest prayer where I really said God made me wait was 16 years. And when I started out, it never occurred to me I'd be waiting 16 years or I'd been really ticked off. But 16 years, I waited for an answer. So when I was about 20, um, I really felt at that point in my life I was ready to settle down. My friends were settling down, and I was ready to settle down. And so you're kind of looking around, and the who could I settle down with? And I had been raised that you pray about everything. So I took it to God. I said, help me find the right mate. You know, I mean, there's there always a high divorce rate. And I said, I want to find the right person. I want someone who also loves God like I do. But help me. Because that's what you do. You ask God and you, you ask. And he didn't answer that prayer for 16 years. And i got to be honest with you. The last five years, I was pretty angry. You know, 10 years, it was hard. It was a stretch. But by the last five years, not only were my, all my friends married and had children, but they were on their second marriages. Like, it was kind of like, seriously, God? Like, I have been waiting a long time. I am really trying to live the way you tell me. I keep showing up at church, and you're just not answering my prayers. But I learned some things during that time. And I know many of you have learned these lessons as well. Sometimes you have to wait. But in the midst of persistent prayer, there are lessons to be learned. There are things that rise up that God teaches us. So I want to show you, there's, there's, I'm going to point out four, but there's many, many more. But these are the four that really kind of I saw rise up in my life. And so I want to share this with you. I want to begin. The very first one is that persistent prayer brings spiritual growth. All right, there's this great story in the book of Mark. It's in um, chapter 7, and it's called the story of the Canaanite women, the Canaanite woman. Now, whenever Scripture gives you, like, a certain detail, like says Canaanite woman, take note, because that's one of the most important parts of the story. Canaanite basically meant in the first century non-Jew. It really didn't matter what we were. It doesn't matter what region you came up, but she was not a Jewish woman. Yet she was coming to Jesus because she needed something, and no one was going to stop her. She had a need and involved a daughter, and she came to Jesus because she had heard about his miracles, and she came to ask him to give her what she needed. And when she first got there, the, the disciples were kind of like, she was kind of considered like pestering everybody, and she wasn't given, you know, as much attention because she wasn't Jewish. That was, that was you know, very obvious to the, to the disciples, and they were kind of pushing her away. And then she finally makes it to Jesus, and it even sounds like Jesus is a little irritated with her. But then suddenly his story flips. Jesus is acting almost slightly cranky with her, and then suddenly he's naming her as the model of faith. And that would have been crazy insulting to all the Jewish people in the audience. <laughs> Wait, what? A Canaanite woman is the model? Seriously? Did you, are you, do you know what you're saying? But this is what happens. When we ask God with persistence, the strangest thing happens. We get more determined. As you keep asking, you start asking more. Finally, it gets like, I am not backing down. I'm not leaving this place, God. I am determined. I'll do whatever it takes. But it's just the persist in your persistent praying, you become more persistent. With days and weeks of praying and even years, you get to determine that God's going to give you the thing he said, that you, the thing that you need because you know he loves you. And then it's sort of like, I, I'll, you know, God, I'll wait. I'm serious. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just going to keep asking. And that actually happens within us. As we wait on God, our faith grows. Don't ask me to explain that. It just does. And it's the strangest thing. And then suddenly we're models of faith. And you're like, how can I be a model of faith? I remember I was in seminary. And some girl came to me, and I was single still, and she was like, Oh, we always talk about you. You're sort of like the patron saint of single women. I'm like, great. That's just what I wanted. 
But I realized that people sort of looked at me as having much faith. And I'm thinking, if you heard the conversations between God and I, you'd be pretty horrified. But does something does change in us when we're persistent. Number two, prayer opens up new possibilities. This is one of my favorite stories. It's in the New Testament. It's about two men who don't know each other, and God brings them together to make an amazing change. It begins with a man named Peter, who is a persistent prayer. And Peter has actually gone up to the roof to be consistent in his prayer time. But I'll be really honest with you, he's hungry. He's thinking about lunch, which is, makes me feel good because it's very hard to stay focused when you're praying sometimes. Sometimes if you're hungry or you hear noises, it's hard to stay. It's okay. God takes what we give him. So he's on the roof thinking about food. When God starts speaking through his hunger and starts giving him this new revelation and points out to him that he actually has issues with racism and legalism. At the same time, God's also speaking to a man named Cornelius, who is not a Jew, who lives somewhere else, and he's a consistent, says he's constantly praying. He loves God. He's constantly praying. And God whispers in his ear and says, I want you to find this man named Peter. And God brings them together. And based on that, re this coming together, an understanding of who God is is changed in the New Testament. This new revelation comes out of God that God loves everyone equally. He doesn't care where you're from. He loves us all equally. And that's not like huge to us, but that was huge in the first century because they still pretty much thought like it's good to be a Jew. Now it's, it's good to be human. God loves all of us. And that was this new possibility that came out of persistent prayer. During the years I was praying and asking God to send this, this person that, would, that I would do my life with, I got my call. I honestly think I don't think I would have ever heard a call had he talked to me early in my life. I would have gotten busy having children. I would have gotten caught up in all the other realities. But somewhere, as I was bugging God for a spouse, I heard a call to ministry. It was kind of something I had never considered. I, why would I do that? Prayer brings up new possibilities. Number three, persistent prayer creates a relationship. There is a theologian, a modern theologian, who has passed, but he's still considered of, of this century, and he's a Catholic priest named Henry Now, and he said this. It might sound strange, but God wants to find me as much as, if not more than, I want to find God. God wants a relationship with us. And the means he's given us is prayer. And in those times when we're doing persistent prayer, we're asking over and over, a relationship occurs. Think about it when you take a job and you, and you start working with some people that you don't particularly like, and then one day you realize you're now friends because you were talking. And you started seeing each other and hearing stories. And before you know it, you're, you're hanging with people that you never even thought you would normally reach out to. But because of circumstances and getting to know each other's story, you become friends. Well, it's kind of the same thing with God. As you, as you persistently talk to him, you begin to observe him and his ways. And you observe his ways in other people and the way he moves in other people's lives. And after a while, you have a real relationship with God. It's very real, and you understand the things of God. Persistent prayer really teaches you about who God is. And you see his faithfulness in some areas, and you don't see his faithfulness in other areas, and you can be honest with him. I mean, some of the best conversations are when you're mad at God. It is okay to be mad at God. It's all right, because if you can talk through the anger and the frustration and all the things that he's not doing what you need, you come outside of that closer. When I was um, early years of marriage, I read this book that's taught you how to, to fight well. And you're like, how can you fight well? That's an oxymoron. But the reality is, if you learn to fight in a healthy way, you come out closer. So the same thing's kind of true with God. A relationship forms in your struggle with him. And honestly, you're going to struggle with him sometimes, and it's okay. He can handle it. Number four, persistent prayer brings about the best outcomes. My sister and I call this the gift of time. Sometimes when you start asking God for something, 
you know what the answer should be. It's obvious to everybody, right? And you tell God that. And then you start praying and praying, and, it, and it doesn't, he doesn't do anything. And you're waiting, and he's pretty silent, and you're praying, and you're praying. And then with the gift of time, you start opening up to new options and new possibilities. Like, I, was, I know the answer. This is what I want. And then all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, oh, but I would take that. Oh, that would work too, yeah. Seriously, God, I'll take anything at this point. But you start opening up to other ways of looking at things. And that's called the gift of time. That only happens over time. So during that persistent praying, God uses time to change our hearts and make us open. So when Gary and I were going to come, we knew because we were appointed at one church for such a long period of time, we knew when we were leaving. We knew we'd leave when our um, youngest graduated from high school. We knew that for years. And we kind of warned people for years, oh, they'll move us when the youngest graduates. So we knew for sure that we were leaving, I don't know, one to two years before we left. And we had, we're pretty sure we leave in, in before that. And so for Gary, he is a consistent prayer, and he prays. But for me, I define it differently. I consistently pray and worry at the same time, okay? I'd like to say that I had great faith, but no, I'm a worrier, so I pray and worry together. I can do it well both. I do both well together. And so for probably two years, I had a lot of time to consider all the absolute worst scenarios that could possibly happen because I always go there too. And, um, and so we were just thinking, oh, my gosh, what if we get sent here? What if we get sent here? And what if we get sent here? But eventually, eventually, it got easier at the end to say, all right, God, seriously, you come through always. I'm still scared, but whatever you want. I mean, you're so good to us. You, you're faithful. Sometimes life doesn't go the way we like, but the outcomes usually are good. And I got there. I got to a place of being trusting God for the outcome. And then he sent us here. And we keep pitching each other saying, can you believe what a good appointment we got? <laughs> there were so many other possibilities. We got really blessed here. Can you believe it? You see, because God knows what the best outcome is. But sometimes, oh, it's really hard. It's really hard, especially when you're in the midst of the problem. When you're in the midst of the addiction or you're in the midst of the financial crisis or you're in the midst of the illness or you're in the midst of a broken relationship, whatever it is you're in, I don't want to simplify this. When you're in the midst of your deepest and darkest days, persistent prayer is not fun. And it's... You know, your relationship with God, it's going to be tough. But I want to assure you, that's what a life of prayer is. That's how Christians talk to God. That's what it sometimes looks like. But God will still use your prayers. And he will bring an answer. Go back to the love of God for us. He loves us so much more than any human relationship. There will be an answer. But we may have to wait. But I encourage you today, be persistent. Hold on. Be real with God. Tell him how you really feel. And know that he's with you. Will you pray with me? Loving God, I thank you for the assurance that you do come through. I thank you for the assurance that we are loved. And I thank you that you use something as simple as our prayers to bring out things in us that we didn't even think were possible. That you even use our prayer life to transform our hearts and create new possibilities. Loving God, we, we come to you with all the needs in our lives. I specifically lift up those folks at the FedEx this past week who were um, killed. Loving God, there's a whole new group of families and friends who are devastated because of that shooting. It doesn't make any sense, and we think, God, we've been asking you to solve this issue of mass shootings for a long time now. 
God, we've been asking you about this for a very long time, and yet they still are happening. But with persistent prayer, we will not give up. And we will ask you to be with those families. And we will ask you to be with our country. And we ask that you will bring us healing. And you will, we ask that you will bring us an answer. And we ask that you will bring change. So those senseless murders will stop. And we will not stop asking you, God. Because we understand how much you love us. Loving God, help us to be a people who in spite of the circumstances can look to you and can still believe. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hi, I'm uh, Reverend Gary Rydat. I'm the other co-pastor here. I'm the 16-year wait that she was talking about. <laughs> it was 22 years for me, so anyway. But uh, it's nice to, to pause every once in a while and take a look uh, back on where we are with the church, where we've been, to uh, look back, reflect back in the last quarter, and to see what exciting things are happening and that, that even though you may not be around that much, as some at home may not have been back to church for a while, the church is still alive and thriving, and we're excited about that. If you want to be really excited about that, go take your car this morning after service behind the Family Life Center. There's a ton of youth out there. And you can tell church is really alive when they have a wonderful youth program and a wonderful, vibrant children's program. There's a lot of kids back there. They won't, they'll do it very quickly, so you don't have to wait very long. So uh, it's just exciting to, to see that. So uh, uh, we just want to thank you because you have supported all these ministries with your generous giving. And we hope that you'll continue to do that. Uh, and if, you're, uh, if, if you want to uh, be feel led to give today, you can go online to samuc.life or go on to the church app and give online. Or if you're here in the sanctuary, you have baskets in the back. But uh, So let's take a look at the, uh, the last quarter of our church. And uh, as a, again, I thank you for how you have supported this church. Hello, St. Andrews. I'm Ryan Niemeyer, Church Council Chair. I'm here to provide our first quarterly update for 2021. I want to let you know how St. Andrews has hit the ground running this year. In January, we held a strategic planning retreat with church leaders to revisit our mission and vision statements and spend time focusing on the why. By better understanding the why and how we do ministry, we can be focused more on our goals and strategies for reaching people for Christ. In February, our preschool safely held their annual preschool bike rally, where all the preschoolers got to race around the campus on their bikes to raise money um, as a fundraiser for families in need. We also participated in a district Super Bowl food pantry drive. Even though our golfed Central District lost, St. Andrews brought in an overwhelming amount of food to help support people in the community who are in need. We held another successful virtual family promise week um, at the Family Promise Day Center and are always amazed at the willingness and generosity of our congregation to serve. Lent came early this year and we started off the season with an in-person and online Ash Wednesday service. We provided ashes for people who weren't able to join us in person so that they could participate from the comfort of their homes. We also offered booklets with a Lenten reading plan and activities to participate in during Lent, including seeds to make a resurrection garden, our congregation and community was encouraged to join a small group to read through the book of John together. We were able to offer 10 small groups and many were blessed as they made relationships with each other while building their relationship with God. We kicked off March by winning both first and second place in Cornerstone's annual Wonder Walk. We had the most participants and raised the second most um, amount of money. A huge thanks to everyone who participated. We also met our goal of more than 100 people attending this year's virtual Nehemiah Action. We're looking forward to hearing more about their successes from the event after this month's Hope Celebration. Our preschoolers prepared for Easter with lots of fun activities that brought giggles and happiness to both our students and the teachers. We prepared for Holy Week this year with Stations of the Cross boxes. The boxes provided an experiential journey for individuals, 
families and groups to walk through the last days of Jesus' life. Almost 150 boxes were distributed to our congregation, preschool teachers and families, Family Promise program members, and individuals at the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. We were also able to offer two beautiful in-person and online Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services, thanks to our worship leaders and youth. We want to keep you updated on the financial status of the church as well. We had a lot of expenses early in the year, which put us a little behind giving, but March and April are shaping up to be really strong months. We always want to make sure that you know how much we appreciate your support and giving and know that we couldn't do ministry without it. We're hoping to get more people on board as online recurring givers. It's a super easy process, and by doing this, you can make a huge impact in the life of the church. Any donation, no matter the size, can make a difference. If you are interested in setting up a recurring gift, please contact the church office and we'll be happy to get you set up. Now we'd love to give you an update about our children and youth ministries, so I'm gonna hand it over to Katie Gregory. Thanks, Ryan. I'm Katie Gregory, and I'm the Director of Children's Ministry. We have had so many awesome things going on this year, but I'm going to tell you about a couple of my favorites. The most exciting thing is that we were able to open back up for in-person kids worship on Sundays during the 945 service with advanced reservation. We have been having so much fun worshiping together, and we also have been continuing our Spark program virtually on Wednesday nights where we meet virtually and learn the Word of God together. We also got to see lots of families on campus during our egg hunt, and that was so much fun to be able to fellowship with the families, to be able to craft together, and of course, get some Easter eggs. We are also really excited to be holding an in-person BBS this summer. That will be from July 19th until the 23rd and will be a Rainforest Explorer theme. We are so excited about this and more information will be coming soon. And now to Rachel Grafton to hear an update on our youth. Thanks, Katie. Hi, I'm Rachel Grafton and I am the Director of Youth Ministry. We have also hit the ground running in 2021. Not only are we gathering in person every Sunday, but we have actually been to Warren Willis not once, but twice in the last three months. We, the last quarter, we have really focused in on growing closer to each other and growing closer to God, particularly with our Lent series um, called Forever, where we talked about um, the hope and love of Jesus will forever be bigger than all of our hopes and worries that we experience in our life. I am also really excited about how this year we have launched our small group Sundays. This time is really focused group within our um, focus time within our small groups where we um, gather and just bond with one another and we even aim to meet off campus once a month. Our confirmation class also began meeting in January. I would like to note that this is our biggest confirmation class that we've had in a very long time, and we are really excited to celebrate these confirmands on May 2nd, which will be Confirmation Sunday. Later on in May, we will also celebrate our graduating seniors with Senior Sunday being on Sunday, May 23rd. So look forward to those two Sundays coming up. Um, we've also have a jam-packed, exciting summer, so stay tuned for those plans that we have coming. Now back to Ryan with a few closing thoughts. Thanks, Rachel. We're also off to a great start this year and can't wait to see where the rest of the year takes us with God's guidance and provision. We encourage you to stay connected by following us on Facebook and Instagram and keeping up with our Friday connection and weekend recap emails. Our Church Center app is also a great way to stay engaged and we invite you to check that out if you haven't already. We're committed to our vision of igniting hope in 2021, and we hope you'll join us as we lead people to know God and experience His grace through a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, I always love seeing those updates. Actually, I shared in staff meeting this week, uh, that's what hooked Casey and I here uh, when we started coming here before I was ever up here leading worship or anything like that is uh, seeing that the church was a church that didn't just stay holed up in that building. It wasn't just like that church over there, but really uh, had a heart for the community and for the people and for each other. And that's what following Jesus looks like, right? So it's nice to be part of a so part of something that is is really uh, seeking God's will and seeking to reach out and show His love to others. Uh, why don't you stand and join us as we close? Uh, we're going to sing a, one more song real quick. Where 
where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. Yeah. Light into the world, light into my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I see, knowing I will find all I need in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, so in you there's life. In you there's life everlasting. In you there's freedom for my soul. In you. There's joy, unending joy. I will follow where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Uh, before we go, just one thought I was thinking as uh, Jane was speaking about prayer is to stay focused and to stay persistent. We have to be able to trust God with the outcome. And a lot of times we like to rely on ourselves and not on God. So that can be our, like our thought or our challenge for this week as we go out to trust God with the outcome. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much that you are a God that we can trust and that you are our Father, you are our friend. And I pray that we would have that uh, sense and that realization this week in every situation that we encounter. In your name, amen. All right, well, thank you for joining us. Have a good week.